eventually turned out to be more vicious against the Republicans than many other, you know, even British leaders at many different times of, of Irish history. He was the greatest twister and the greatest traitor in Irish history because he had uh, men in jail for resisting arrest. He had them taken before the military court. They were sentenced to death. Sentence carried out within 48 hours with no right to appeal and for as little as resisting arrest. He brought over the English hangman to hang Charlie. De Valera now saw military action against his government as an attack on Ireland itself. De Valera said, all I have to do is look into my own heart if I want to know what the Irish people want. And he did feel that, in a sense, he was Ireland. And in a funny kind of way, he was right. Looking at De Valera, it seems hard to comprehend that this awkward, austere figure could have inspired the nation as a charismatic nationalist leader. Yet the decisions of the chief were accepted unquestioningly. He had this, if you like, God-given gift of leadership as I see it. He had, and of course many others have remarked that, he had this extraordinary capacity of making a momentous decision with extraordinary rapidity. And when he was contemplating something, he had the characteristic of putting his two index fingers like that to his lips and looking straight out in front and in total silence. And then you could almost see him making the decision. Because he'd do that. Once the hands parted, apparently the decision was made. From his family, he expected obedience and order. He was always very particular about his exercise, and he was a splendid walker, but a rather rapid one. And he had a certain drill, a certain formula. Myself and my brother Rory led, and then in order of seniority, we went in files of two, and he brought up the rear with my mother. And in those days, there was very little traffic in the Wicklow Hills, but if he heard a car coming, because he had the most keen sense of hearing, uh, he would roar out from the back, Indian file, by which we meant that we had to get in single file until this solitary car passed, and then the order would be, as you were, and we'd carry on our walk that way. De Valera's straight-backed, inscrutable presence had a special appeal of its own in communities which, during years of British rule, had always looked to the priest as their true representative. The first thing I remember, Louis, my brother and I, we were out in the back of the house and the word came round, it was a car after pulling up, you see. And I saw this big tall man and I can remember distinctly he had a black cape on him. Then we were on his little lads, six and seven. We were absolutely frightened of him, but still, being a legendary figure, uh, we were mm, three times the same as we three times the God, you know. Admirers would genuflect to kiss the hand of this cardinal of Catholic politics. There is this mythical story uh, about de Valera that uh, a very well-known bishop who happened to physically uh, resemble de Valera picked up de Valera's coat and put it on innocently uh, after a meeting. And when he got home to his diocese, he discovered that in the pocket was a copy of Niccolo Machiavelli's The Prince. And he was so horrified at having this devilish book in his pocket that he never spoke to de Valera again. A living argument rather than a living man was the poet W.B. Yeats's verdict on de Valera. A letter he wrote to his son Vivian during the negotiations with the British starts chattily, but continues with five dense-packed pages of mathematical equations, a sort of secret family language. I think probably de Valera, as a man, dealt with people through forms, through abstract forms, and he defines people by how they fitted in with certain kind of diagrams that he had in his head. He used to draw diagrams um, to illustrate the difference between his version of the Irish Republic and Collins's version of the Irish Republic. And, you know, he'd have these kind of parabolas and triangles and <laughs> geometric shapes. Uh, he does seem to have been somebody who actually thought in terms of geometry, which he then tried to apply to reality. De Valera crafted his policies in line with his traditional views, 
and with a shrewd eye for the rural conservative population that was the backbone of his support. He made the Gaelic language the country's official tongue. Economic tariffs were placed on British goods. Divorce was not permitted. Winning back the north of Ireland had been a side issue at the time of the treaty negotiations in the Civil War. Now, it became de Valera's mantra. You asked me what are my hopes for the future relations between the peoples of Ireland and Great Britain. I have always said that I desired to establish friendly relations between the two peoples. That is still my desire and hope. But the historic Irish nation has been artificially divided. As war threatened in Europe, de Valera was at last offered the chance to make reunification a reality. Meanwhile, in peace, the Germans enter Sudetenland. The barrier is raised and the cars drive in. Neville Chamberlain was now the occupant of number 10 Downing Street, someone de Valera could do business with. De Valera was um, a firm supporter of Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Many people, of course, in Europe, in Europe were, many people in Britain. But Dev was a real enthusiast. Um, he saw some parallels. He saw Tyrone and Fermanagh, certainly, in South Armagh, and the immediate, uh, predominantly nationalist areas just north of the border. He often called them his Sudetenland. Uh, in other words, that if there had to be a border, it was in the wrong place. Uh, Chamberlain understood him, and they really got on terribly well together. Along the ragged south and west coast of Ireland were three ports still manned by the British Navy. In 1938, in a grand gesture, Chamberlain had handed these treaty ports over to his friend in Dublin in return for a vague promise of good relations with the Irish. Churchill, of course, backbencher, raged against this this change, and in fact described the main negotiator, Malcolm MacDonald on the British side, as rat poison because of his, his role in getting the treaty ports back into de Valera's hands. With the British troops gone, Ireland's ports were no longer potential German targets. The way was open for de Valera to declare Ireland neutral in World War II. It was a policy that prevented Ireland's old nationalist political splits from ripping open again. But Winston Churchill, now Britain's Prime Minister, was incensed. He thought de Valera had outmaneuvered Chamberlain and was now putting the whole war effort at risk. Churchill had a very Anglo-centric view of things. Um, he, for instance, said, era is at war, but skulking. He did not believe in Irish neutrality, didn't believe it was de Valera's call. He thought it was his call. The British felt that, in accordance with the old maxim that England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity, many Irish were discreetly giving support to the Germans. And in some places, they were. To be 1940 or 1941, when I accompanied, as a very young boy, a, a man who worked for us, for our family, to a little harbour about seven miles from Dingle. And I recall bringing provisions, and we transferred those to waiting personnel from what I immediately gathered to be a U-boat, and they were speaking German. They transferred it quite quickly, efficiently, and they were on their way. So there was no such thing as sitting down having cigarettes or anything like that. I felt great. I felt that I was part of a global story for those few minutes. In the summer of 1940, with the nations of Europe falling to the Germans, Churchill knew that the Irish ports were vital if the Navy was to protect Atlantic convoys from Hitler's U-boat attacks. He needed the Irish in the war, and he had just one bargaining chip. Northern Ireland. The man he'd called Rat Poison was again sent to Dublin to do the deal. <laughs> 